We welcome all of you to our Friday evening prayer service. Let's bow in prayer, begin with the word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege that you've given to us to come together to pray, but not only to pray, but also to learn how to pray. Pray that today that you will teach us to pray. Lead us and guide us in this time of prayer. Make this time a very fruitful time where we will learn to pray the prayers that fulfill the visions and the dreams of your heart. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. During our prayer time on Friday evenings, we not only pray, but we also teach people to pray. Now, we teach a particular method of prayer. It is called praying the Bible. It is simply using the word of God in prayer. Why we use the word of God in prayer? Because the word of God reveals the heart of God, the will of God, the plan and the purpose of God and so on. When you pray using the word of God, your prayer is on a different level. You're, instead of simply praying for small things that we see as our need, sometimes our world becomes just our little world in which we live and our needs, which is unfortunate. God's world is a big world. God's plan is a big plan. God's purposes are very great. And we are part of God's plan and purpose. So when we use the word of God to pray, the big picture is always there. We pray for bigger things. We pray for the great plan and purpose of God to be fulfilled. And we pray for, even when we pray for our needs, whether spiritual or material, it really, we really address needs that we never otherwise uh, address. We never think about praying for certain things but when we use the word of God for prayer, those things come before us, come into focus. So we've been looking at the book of Psalms and because it's a book of prayer, really. We have wonderful prayers written there to be sung to the Lord and uh, it yields itself very conveniently for the task of prayer. So we're looking at the book of Psalms. We covered 50 Psalms. Last week we began on Psalm 51. And today we'll continue Psalm 51. Let me first tell you the six divisions of Psalm 51. And then we will deal with the second one today. Last week we dealt with the first part. Psalm 51 can be divided into six parts. The first part is where Psalmist comes and approaches God with a cry for forgiveness. He cries to God for forgiveness. Second section is verses 3 to 6. First section is verse 1 and 2. Second is 3 to 6, where there is the confession of his sin in 3 to 6 that we're going to study today. And then verse 7 to 9 is the third part where there is an appeal for cleansing. Then the fourth part is where he expresses a desire for inward renewal or the creating of a pure heart. That's verse 10 to 12. And then the fifth part is verse 13 to 17, where he promises God that if he is forgiven, if God will forgive him and restore him, that he will teach others the lessons about forgiveness that he has learned. And uh, part six is a concluding prayer for the prosperity of Zion, which is found in verse 18 and 19. All right. We looked at the first part last week. Let me remind you what we looked at. We looked at how Psalmist approaches God and cries out to God for forgiveness. Let me read to you the first two verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. The context, you must remember immediately. What is the context of Psalm 51? The context, context is where he has 
sin, the great sin, the sin of adultery. He took Bathsheba, another man's wife, and made her pregnant. And then connivingly kills her husband, who was actually in his army as a soldier, kills her husband. Terrible thing, two great sins. Two terrible sins for which under the law there is no remedy, <laughs> only death is the punishment. There is no sacrifice that he could offer. There is nothing that could remedy that sin. That's the way the Moses law states about these two sins. He has committed both these sins, sins worthy of death, terrible sins. And in that context, he writes, you know, after that, then Nathan, the prophet of God, comes and tells him that he is the sinner and that uh, he knew that now God knew. <laughs> And so he cries out to God, and that is Psalm 51. In the first two verses, two things come together, I said. One is, he's clinging to God's mercy. He's crying out for God's mercy. He says, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from all my sin." So he's clinging to God for his mercy. And I showed you last week, anytime we come to God in prayer, we come on the basis of only God's mercy. We don't come saying, I've been so good, I've been so just, I've been so right, therefore I ask you to do this for me. That's not the way to pray. The way you come to God in prayer is you come on the basis of mercy. Only mercy. And so he comes calling upon God's mercy and he uses two other words for mercy. He uses the word unfailing love and he also uh, uses the word compassion in New International Version. Unfailing love and compassion. So mercy, unfailing love and compassion. It is the, it is the basis with which he comes to God. He says, I come to you because I know you'll be merciful. Your love will not fail me and you'll have compassion on me. And uh, he comes to God like that. And secondly, see, so that he's clinging to God for mercy. Secondly, the thing that is happening here is he has a tremendous revelation of his sin and its true nature in the midst of the darkness of all that has happened, in the midst of all the sin that he has committed and uh, the whole situation of sin and sinfulness, he receives the greatest revelation on sin and uh, begins to get an understanding of sin's true nature. And there we saw three words. He uses the word transgressions, and I told you what transgressions are. Transgression is where a line is drawn and you're told not to cross that line and if you cross that line, you're wrong. You're on the wrong. Knowing very well where the line is, seeing very clearly where the line is drawn, you still cross it. It's a, it's a willful rebellion. It's a defying of God. It's defying God and willfully going against God's laws. That's what transgression is, where you cross the line knowing you should not cross the line knowing very well where the line is. Secondly, he uses the word iniquity. The word iniquity means perversion and it talks about a sin nature, a perverted kind of uh, thinking and outlook that comes as a result of a nature of sin. And it's a reference to original sin. It's talking about uh, the fact that uh, from his birth, he's got sin inside him. He's born like that. Because of Adam's sin, we all became sinners. We inherited Adam's sin nature. So he's talking about this iniquity, this, this terrible, perverted um, nature that he has in his heart now. And third word he uses is the word sin. And sin means falling short or missing the mark. You're aiming to a target, 
You're never hitting the target. You're always falling short. So transgression is willful violation of God's laws. Iniquity is sin nature, a perversion of the heart. Sin is not being able to live according to God's expectation, never reaching the target, never hitting the target, always falling short, always missing the target, never able to live according to God's laws. What a great revelation concerning sin. And he says, when he talks about these three words, he says, my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. He says, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. There is a tremendous awareness of his sin. And we went to Psalm 32. And Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, refer to the same three word, words I showed you, transgression, iniquity, and sin, uh, where the psalmist says, blessed is the man, he says. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Uh, Psalm 51 was written immediately after he was found out, after his sin, he was found out. And Psalm 32, they say he may have written it later, reflecting on this whole thing, on this whole episode. And remembering that he promised God that he will teach sinners about forgiveness. So he reflects on what has happened, how God forgave him, how God restored him, and then writes Psalm 32 later on. And that is why he says, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, and for whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And there he talks about what sin does when you don't confess it, how your bones dry up and your flesh becomes sick and all that. And he teaches a great lesson to sinners, people who sin, and keep it inside, never confess it. He talks about what happens when you keep it in and not confess it, and what happens when you confess and leave it, how God delivers you and cleans you and washes you from that sin. All right, we looked at that already. But let's look at verse three to six. Let me read to you verse three to six, and that's what we're gonna look at today. And pray on the basis of those things. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, justified, when you judge. So here the psalmist confesses his sin. He makes three very strong statements again. In the first two verses we saw that he uses three words to describe God's mercy and love. He uses the word mercy, love and compassion. And then he uses three words for sin, which are transgressions, iniquity and sin. Here, he uses three very strong statements. In the midst of his sin, he begins to realize what sin really is. Isn't that something? Sin has really crushed him, makes him feel so bad, but right in the middle of all that, he is getting a real revelation of what sin really is. Three very strong statements. One is, he says, I am aware of my sin, in verse three. He says, I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. So there is an awareness of his sins. The problem with, with some people is, they don't confess their sins because they don't believe themselves to be sinners. They don't believe they've sinned in any way. Because they don't recognize that what they have done is, is sin. They're not very clear about what sin is. Sometimes people never think about what sin is. They don't think what they are doing is sin. And so, here the psalmist very clearly knows that what he has done is sin. He knew it when he did it. He knew it before it. He knew it while he was doing it. He knew it when Nathan the prophet came and reminded him of it. He's very much aware of it. And look at Psalm 32 again in verse three and four. Psalm 32, 
because this has a lot to do with Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is also a reflection on this situation, this context. Psalm, Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. So he says, uh, talks about what his state of mind was at that time. He says, he was groaning all the day long and his strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. No strength, exhausted, groaning all day long, he said. That's the feeling that he had. That's the state of mind in which he was when he was aware of his sin. You know, when we sin also, it really brings our mind to the lowest levels. Our motivations are gone. We feel like we have no strength. We feel exhausted. We feel tired, worn out. And we groan all day long, just like he says. It's a terrible feeling. Sin is something that destroys you mentally, emotionally, in every way. It really hurts you in your mind. Doesn't let you live happily. Doesn't let you eat and sleep and work normally. Something happens to you where you feel like you're totally exhausted. You're not able to work. You are groaning all the day long. There is a sadness. There is a guilt. All of these things really bother us. Awareness of sin. That is awareness of sin. Second statement is, he says he knows that it is sin. Look at verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. So he is saying here that he knows that it is sin because he says against you and you only have I sinned. Many people say, well, really he has sinned against Bathsheba, that poor woman. When a king calls her, how can she not say no? He had more power, much more power than her. So she had to really respond to him in that way. You can't blame her. Has he not sinned against her? She was another man's wife and he took her and that was a sin against her. He also sinned against her husband. Her husband was her faithful soldier. When he came on holidays, he wouldn't even go home because he said, my people are fighting for my country. How can I go home and sleep in peace? I want to sleep at the king's doors. He was sleeping at the door of his palace because he didn't want to go home. He was sleeping, guarding the king. He was such a faithful soldier and he took his life. He killed him. So is it not a sin against him? Yeah, he sinned against Bathsheba, sinned against her husband Uriah. He also sinned against the people of God, the people of Israel because he was their king. They trusted him. They respected him. They honored him. They looked up to him. They depended on him. He was made a king because he defeated the greatest enemy of Israel. That's how he came to power. But now, all that respect and all that honor is wasted because this man has done something that will be a sin against the people who trusted him and depended on him. So people say he sinned against Bathsheba, sinned against uh, Uriah, the husband, sinned against the people of Israel. But here he says, I've sinned against you only. If he said, I sinned against you, that's all right. But he said, I sinned against you only. In other words, he's talking as if he never sinned against anybody, but he sinned only against God. How can he say that? Well, a couple of reasons why he can say that. You need to understand there is a big revelation about sin here. Sin by its very definition is an act that is against God. 
sins, it is only by God's law that sin is defined as sin. See, certain things when you do, the world doesn't call it a sin. <laughs> Suppose you murder somebody, that's a crime, right? In the world, it's a crime. When you come to God's word, it's not crime anymore, it's a sin. The world doesn't recognize sin. They don't know God. They don't talk about sin. They only talk about crime. So they say, this fellow has committed a crime. He needs the police. He needs the court. He needs the judge. He needs a case against him. He needs punishment to be given to him. It has nothing to do with God. No issue with God. It's just a crime, they say. They reduced it to a crime. Yeah, but now they've reduced it even further. They've reduced it to a sickness. The guy murders and then goes and gets a certificate saying, mind is not right. You know, he's got confusion in his mind, he's mentally not fit, and so on. Sometimes they let him go after a few months, you know, because he's mentally not right. They've reduced sin to that level, to crime and then to just sickness. So if you got sickness, if murder is just sickness, then all you need is a doctor, not even police, you know. All you need is a hospital. What a terrible thing. A society which does not recognize God and uh, sin is a society where you will find uh, lawlessness becoming very rampant because you think it's just a mental problem, or you think that it's just a crime. But the Bible teaches the right thing when it is believed and when a society begins to believe in that and follows that and teaches that. I'll tell you, there'll be great benefits. God says it's a sin. It's a sin against God. Why is it a sin against God? Those acts of David, the adultery and murder was sin against God. Why? Because God's law says thou shalt not commit adultery. God's law says thou shalt not commit murder. That's why it's a sin. Secondly, it's a sin because when you do something against another person, it's a sin. Why? Because the other person that you do these things against, the woman that he has violated, the man that he has, from whom he has taken that man's wife, all that, you know, they are neighbors, they are human beings. As such, what he did to them is wrong because they are made in the image and likeness of God when you do something like that to a neighbor, when you do something like that to another human being, you are wrong and uh, you have sinned because you have literally desecrated the image of God. You have literally gone against your neighbor who is made in the image and likeness of God. It's just like murdering somebody, you know. It's not just an ordinary sin. It's a, Bible clearly says when God told Noah, he said, you shall not murder. Why? Because man is made in the image and likeness of God. So that's why all wrong done to our neighbor is wrong, done to one who created us in the image of God. All wounding of another whether in person or property, in body or soul, is a sin against the goodness of God. Yeah. And when a person sees that, that's a true revelation of what sin is. Yeah. David realizes that. Look at the words he uses here. Against you and you only have I sinned, done what is evil in your sight. And look at, now, look at this now. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now that particular portion of that verse is quoted in Romans chapter 3, verse 4. You're right in your verdict. You're justified when you judge. God is right. He realizes God is right and he is wrong. He realizes man is made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, he should not have done what he has done. He should not have done that to that woman. He should not have done that to that man. All of that amounts to a great sin because he has acted against those people that have 
been made in the image and likeness of God. When Nathan, kept, when Nathan the prophet came to him and exposed his sin, immediately he recognizes, he gets a, maybe he didn't think of these things when he did it. Maybe he didn't think of these things even after he did it. He knew it was wrong, but he didn't think of it in terms of something wrong against God. He knew that he had done that man wrong. He knew that he had done that woman wrong, done the people wrong, but he did not realize that it was against God. That's the difference. Now when Nathan comes and tells him and reveals to him that God knows, he realizes he is really getting a revelation of what sin is. He says, I have sinned only against God. And God is right and I am wrong. I am wrong and therefore I am a sinner. I have sinned against God. Yeah. What a revelation. Yeah. The first thing that happens is that he is aware of sin. Secondly, he admits that it is sin. And thirdly, he confesses that his sin comes from his thoroughly evil nature that he has. He recognizes where the action came from, where that act came from. Do you realize where our sins come from? It comes from an evil nature. And look at the words he uses here in verse 5 and 6. I was surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. He says, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He's not blaming his mother. He's not saying, well, I'm like this because of my mother. That's not, that's not the way you should twist it. <laughs> Some people do. He's blaming his mother, they say. No, no, no. He's saying that there has not been one moment in my life that I've been without sin. From the beginning I had sin. Adam's sin has passed on to me. It has been transmitted to me. It's not my mother's problem. It's an age-old problem. Adam's sin has come down to me. It has been transmitted to me from one generation to another generation so that from my birth, from the moment I was made in my mother's womb, I was a sinner. The sin nature has come inside of me. Mother was not to be blamed. Adam and his sin... That's what he's talking about. He says, from the beginning I was a sinner. Sin nature, has, this perversion of heart has happened. That's why I've done this. A normal man would have made in the image and likeness of God would not do something like this. Take another man's wife. He will not kill another man after taking another man's wife. What makes a man do It's a perverted mind. A perverted mind that says that no matter what it costs, I must have what I want. I like this, so I must have it. I must enjoy it. No matter what the cost is, let's think about the cost later. Enjoy it now. Perversion. Seeking pleasure in the wrong way. What a revelation. He says there is never a moment, there was never a moment in his existence when he was not a sinner. He lays on himself the blame of a tainted nature. He is not uh, laying the blame on that one fault or one crime that he committed. The wrong is not just, just the action that he just carried out now. It was wrong, but he's not saying, he's not blaming the whole thing on the adultery or murder. He's blaming the whole thing on a nature that has come in. And he realizes the thing that God desires out of all this, look at the revelation. He desires, that God desires inward purity. God requires a pure heart. That's what God desires. Here is a man that has written so many songs and God has used him so mightily. And out of that sin experience that he had, he comes into a revelation that God desires a pure heart. And in the next section, he's going to pray, asking God to make his heart pure. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Oh, my heart 
is perverted. It's wrong. It's sinful. It has got the taint of sin inside. I've never been without sin. From the moment I was made, sin was there. It has been transmitted. It has come in. And that is that has made me think this way, that has made me act this way, that has driven me in this direction and caused this thing. Clean my heart, O oh God, he cries. He has two needs that he's addressing, and we'll come to that next, but we're going to stop and pray now. Two needs he cries for, and that is pardon from his sin. Secondly, purity of heart. Pardon from his sin and purity of heart. Now, what, the reason we have the Bible is that we can read and meditate on this and get a revelation of what sin is. You don't have to commit a sin in order to get a revelation of what sin is. Thank God we can come to a church like this and open the Bible, read the Bible, meditate on it, and get a profound understanding of what sin is. What is sin? Sin is something that is totally against God. Sin is something that is part of human nature because of the fall. Sin is a terrible thing. It is a perversion. It makes us to do wrong things. And that is why we need to always pray for a pure heart. We need to understand that it is not enough that our actions are right, but it's more important that our heart is right. If our heart is right, it will never result in wrong actions. Every one of us need to pray for a pure, pure heart. Ask God to give us an understanding of what sin is, how it comes in, destroys our life. Just imagine what this man would have been like after he sinned like this. How can you go and sleep peacefully after you've murdered a person? How can you go and sleep peacefully when you've done such a terrible thing to taking another man's wife? You can't have peace after that. After that, you cannot live and enjoy life. It's not going to be normal at all. Your normal life is gone, finished. A lot of people don't understand the consequences of sin. And he talks about it in chapter 32, I mean, Psalm 32. He says, I was groaning all the day long. That's, is that what you want to have? <laughs> groaning all the day long, crying all the day long. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. No strength, exhaustion, tired, sick and tired of life. That's what sin does. No energy. Just imagine. May God grant us a profound revelation of what sin is. We don't have to sin to understand sin. We can just read here and meditate on it and understand one of the things that we need to pray is, Lord, give us an understanding of what sin is, what the consequences of sin is. I don't want to be groaning all the day long. I don't want to lose energy and be exhausted, sick and tired of life. I don't want to be crying all day long. I don't want to, my normal life to be disrupted by this restlessness. I want a clean heart, oh God. Shall we pray? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's begin to pray. Lord, I pray that you will give us a profound revelation through these verses, O oh God, about sin and what sin is, how terrible it is. Sin is something that does not originate with something wrong that we do, but it originates with a sin nature, a perversion that happens because of nature, the sin nature. Something has gone wrong in our heart from the beginning. There is never a moment that we have been without sin. We've all been sinners from the beginning. And Lord, help us today to realize how terrible sin is and how it separates us from God, cuts us off from God, cuts us off from happiness, cuts us off from joy of life, cuts us off from living a normal life, a peaceful life, a blessed life. Thank you, Lord, for showing us through the psalmist that Living in sin is not the blessedness. Blessed is the man whose transgressions the Lord has forgiven. Blessed is the man whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom God does not impute iniquity. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that blessedness. Help us to understand what blessedness is about. Blessedness comes when our transgressions are forgiven, when sin is covered, 
when iniquity is not imputed. Blessedness comes as a result of a pure heart, a heart that God can only give. Blessedness comes when God comes into our hearts and gives us a new heart. And I pray today that you'll help us to understand the blessedness of living free from sin, in victory over sin. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for you have, through the blood of Jesus, washed our sins away, blotted out our sins and our transgression and our iniquities. You have washed us thoroughly from all iniquity and you have cleansed us from our sin and you have really blotted out our transgressions. The blood of Jesus has done it. Only the blood of Jesus could do it. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to realize that, that we will not take sin lightly, that we will not be careless about sin. We will help us to realize the seriousness of sin and all that it causes and all that it brings into our lives. Help us to guard our lives by your help, O oh God. Like the psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against thee. As a protection against sin, help us to hide your word in our hearts. Help us to keep your word in our heart. Help us to read your word, meditate on your word, think about your word, get a revelation of what sin is and the horrors of sin. And help us to keep the word in our hearts. Remember always, that sin is a terrible thing. It disrupts life. It disrupts happiness. It destroys everything good that we have. Help us. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us. Help us never to respond to the enticement of the devil where he tries to entice us with sin. Help us to keep away from it. Help us to realize how terrible sin is. Help us to have a proper understanding of what sin is. It is not a simple wrong. It is not a crime. It is a sin. And it is against God. It's against God. Therefore, it, is, it causes great complications in our lives. And ultimately, destroys us. Destroys us. And I pray that You'll help us to live in peace and happiness and joy. And I pray today that people will understand the true nature of sin, the terrible nature of sin and what it does. That if anyone has sinned and if any time sin even enters in a small way in our lives, help us to confess it. Help us to confess it instead of groaning every day and living like that for many days. Help us to immediately confess it and leave it Help us to seek your help. Help us to get out of it. Help us, O oh God. Oh, thank you, Lord. I pray that those who are praying with us today in here, as well as from all over the world, as people join together to pray with us today, that if there is sin, if they have allowed sin to enter into the heart, I pray that they will realize the seriousness of this sin, that it is like a poison that kills, that they will reach out to you. They will cry out for your mercy like David cries out, for your loving kindness and your compassion, O oh God. Oh, thank you, Father. Help people to cry out today for your mercy, loving kindness and compassion. Help them to cling to mercy. Thank you, Father. Cleanse us. Wash us, blot the transgressions out. Help us, O oh Father, that many people be restored even as we are praying today. Let them reach out to you today, right now. Confess and leave those sins and seek your help for a new heart, for a pure heart. May they be delivered from sins and enter into a life, a life of joy and peace abundant life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. So, when we pray, we can take these matters in prayer. We need to pray that God will give us an understanding of what sin is and what it does and how to get rid of it, how to be free from it, how to enjoy life 
in Christ to the fullest and not allow disruption of that happiness through sin. All right. Now let's go to verse 7 to 9, the third portion, where he is calling upon God to cleanse him. An appeal for cleansing is what we find in verse 7 to 9. Let me read that first. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. In verse 7 to 9, there is a list of three things David wanted God to do again. Again, three things he's talking about. He wanted three things from God. One is, he says, cleanse me with hyssop. That's verse 7. Then he says, wash me. And that is also verse 7. Wash me so that I'll be whiter than snow. Then in verse 9 he says, blot out all my iniquity. Blot out all my iniquity. What is this cleanse? Or cleansing mean? Cleansing means to purge. It, uh, it means to de-sin. <laughs> How do you say it? It means to bring me back to that sinless state or condition. Purge me. David wanted to have his sin completely purged away. He didn't want to even retain even a small stain of that sin. People who are addicted, you know, they go for de-addiction. Like that, he needs to be de-sinned. Get sin out of his life. That's what purging means. Wash refers to the, under the Jewish system, they went through washings, you know, ceremonial washings that signified how they need to be cleansed from their sins. Because Isaiah writes many centuries later in that famous verse in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Isaiah says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's what he wants to happen. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. <laughs> he wants to be washed so that he's whiter than snow. That's what verse 7 says. He wants to be washed. He wanted to be washed until he was as clean as that. The ceremonial washing only represented what truly must take place in the heart. Because only bodily cleansing is not enough. Something must happen in the heart. And David cries out for that. He said, Lord, wash me so that I'll be whiter than snow. So that I'll be clean. Then thirdly, the blot out. The word blot out refers to removing a writing from a book. Particularly to the idea of removing an indictment, a judgment that has been written down. Removing a writing from a book. You know, in those days they wrote on pieces of papyrus. And uh, it was very precious, very expensive. So it's not like paper that you can buy for very cheap and just keep on writing. We today write and throw away and use a fresh paper just like that. But those days the papyrus was very scarcely available and very expensive. And uh, so sometimes they will reuse the papyrus. What they will do is they will rub that papyrus and remove what was, whatever was written there. And uh, then they will turn it to the other side, turn it sideways or, you know, they will turn the papyrus in a different direction and write on that rubbed papyrus where the old writing is erased. That kind of a thing. 
he is thinking about that word refers to blot out is a word that refers to how you blot out even today we use white uh, thing to blot out typed material right something like that you can use the white whitener and then type on top of it all that we have seen that kind of a thing something has been written and what david is talking about is a judgment against him you know some word that puts the punishment on him and he wants that to be blotted out this sin this crime this terrible thing that he has committed has been written in god's book and he wants it to be wiped out he wants it to be blotted out he imagines that the books of our lives have been written upon with many sins and they stand as indictment against us unless something is done they're going to be read out against us one day that's the problem but god can and will do something about it god will rub out those things that are written about us and uh, turn the pages sideways and write over the newly prepared surface the message of his everlasting compassion through the work of jesus christ that's what god does through jesus and his blood today god's book is full of our faults our sins our crimes all that we have done against god its pages are full but through the blood of jesus god rubs out all that writing and writes over that newly prepared surface and what does he write over that he writes over everywhere forgiven completely cleansed i will not remember this sin anymore that's what he writes but this involves great cost because a rubber cannot do it a whitener cannot do it only the blood of jesus can do it so god had to send his son and he had to shed his blood and only the blood of jesus cleanses us the bible says from all unrighteousness now how does the cleansing happen look at this and we'll look at this and pray cleanse me with hyssop he says hyssop was a small plant that grew in plenty in that area and because of its shape and structure it was used like a small brush even back in the days of passover you remember the very first passover exodus chapter 22 i mean exodus chapter 12 verse 22 we read that god instructed them to take a bunch of hyssop dip it in the blood in the basin where they killed that animal the lamb the blood is there in that vessel he said dip it in the basin and put some blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame and they sat inside and they were protected by the blood of the lamb that's why it's called passover the angel of death saw the blood and passed over the jewish households and the first borns were dying all over the country every first born was dying but in the homes of the jewish people where they killed the lamb there was no death there was the death of a substitute a lamb in their place instead of their first born a lamb died it was a rich message and the hyssop that was used was this little plant the hyssop was that little plant that was used to sprinkle the blood and later on in leviticus chapter 14 you read that same hyssop was used to sprinkle blood on people that have been healed of infectious skin diseases in a ceremonial cleansing hyssop was used again in numbers chapter 19 verse 18 it's used again where hyssop is dipped in a similar cleansing they used it to cleanse one who has defiled himself by touching a dead body if you touched a dead body you are defiled and you need cleansing and they once again used the hyssop to sprinkle the blood and cleanse such a person from the defilement the author of book of hebrews in chapter 9 
in verse 19 to 22, he puts it this way. You know, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you this way. When does he say it? When Moses proclaimed every commandment of the Lord to the, all the people, he took the blood of the calves together with water, scarlet wool and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. And at that time he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God had commanded you to keep. And in the same way he sprinkled the blood both, uh, sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with the blood. Without washing of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's the way the Bible teaches. And David understood this. And when he asked God to cleanse him with hyssop, he meant cleanse me with my blood because all the time hyssop was used with sprinkling the blood. Hyssop was dipped into blood and used to sprinkle the doorpost and the lentils on Passover day. Hyssop was used to cleanse people that have been infected with infectious diseases. Used to cleanse them. Hyssop was used to cleanse the defiled person who has touched a dead body. All the time the blood is the thing into which it was dipped and it was used to sprinkle the blood. So David is imagining that. When he said, cleanse me with hyssop, he's saying, Lord, I know what can cleanse my sins. My sins can be cleansed only by the blood of the lamb, the lamb that dies in my place. I deserve death punishment. In fact, in the law, there is no provision for remedying adultery and murder. Death punishment is the only thing. There's no remedy, no sacrifice, nothing that he could offer under the law. He must die. So what he's saying is, for me, a substitute has died. I am deserving of death, but for me, a substitute has died, a lamb has died. And sprinkle that blood and cleanse me. Only that blood can cleanse me. It's a rich message about, of the gospel. The blood of Jesus, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is just and righteous to cleanse us from all our sins. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. Now shall we pray. We need to often pray that the blood of Jesus will be sprinkled upon us. We need to, with our mouth, use our mouth as hyssop really. Now we don't have a hyssop, we have this mouth. We need to confess not only our sin, we need to confess the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. We need to say, Lord, I thank you because your blood cleanses me. Your blood washes me and cleanses me and makes me whole and makes me clean. I thank you, Lord, for the blood has never lost its power. The blood of Jesus has never, never, ever lost its power. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary is still today powerful, power to powerful to cleanse me from all my sins. Thank you for the blood, O oh God. Thank you for the blood that has purged me, washed me, cleansed me, blotted out my transgressions. Thank you, Father. Thank you, blotted out, completely washed, and completely cleansed in such a way that all the sin that was recorded under my name is removed today. And God's love towards me is recorded today. The fact that I'm redeemed today is recorded today. The fact that God loves me is recorded today. The fact that God has compassion upon me, has shown mercy to me, has been kind to me is recorded today. His mercy is for everlasting to everlasting. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you for the slate is made clean and good things are written in there. God's mercy is stated there. God's love is stated there. Unfailing love is declared there. And God's compassion is told there. Thank you, Father. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you for making us whole. And I pray today that those who've had sin come into their lives, that those that have had this disruption by sin, that have, those that have gone far away from God, those that have, for some reason, because of some situations, done things wrong and, and sinned, 
and therefore feel sapped of all energy. Therefore, they're groaning all the day long. Therefore, there is no rest, there is no peace, there is no joy. They've lost their normal life. They're suffering under the guilt and shame. And I pray that the blood of Jesus will cleanse them, O oh God. Cleanse them, cleanse them, wash them, blot out their transgressions completely, clean them out, make them new. Thank you, Father, so that the record of their sins will never be remembered anymore. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the promise. Thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for washes, it washes us and cleanses us from all our sins. I pray today that people that prayed with us today, people that confessed their sins, people that got right with God today, that have come to God and, and confessed their sins, will find that their transgressions are forgiven and their iniquity is blotted out and uh, their sins are covered. Oh, thank you, Father. May peace of God rest upon them. May they have the peace of God, the rest of God, the joy of God restored to them. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have done to David, you are able to do to us today. Thank you for, just like David promised, he has written, he has written so that we may benefit, so that sinners may benefit, so that people who sin today may benefit from this. And thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to understand this. Thank you, Father, for this is written for our benefits, so that sinners will find their way back to God today. Thank you. Thank you for Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 and all that it says. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for relief. Thank you for joy. Thank you for peace that comes into the hearts of people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the way is now clear that we, can, we are restored in our relationship with God, that we can ask and receive. Our heart does not condemn us anymore that we can come to God and receive everything that we need, that we can walk with God. We thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll look at the rest next week when we come.